morning and then welcome to London. <laughs> You've been here for some time. Welcome to a grey morning, which is typical. Uh, wonderful spring morning. Um, excited to be here. We work quite a lot of uh, time with entrepreneurs in my um, research group, which has this wonderful name of um, business ecosystems, which basically integrates business marketing, supply chain management, uh, strategy, entrepreneurship, and innovation. We also have a kind of remit from the business school to help entrepreneurs within the university, but also within the vicinity um, in London, so local entrepreneurs, to develop their ideas. And that usually means working with engineers people who have uh, technological knowledge uh, and I don't know anything about any of these areas of expertise <laughs> so um, but the interesting thing is how do you then get traction interesting ideas interesting possibilities interesting opportunities how do you get traction in a market how do you commercialize an innovation and I guess that what we will be doing with you it's a little experiment is two things I will think more about theories or concepts or frameworks or what I call checklists things that you should know that should sensitize your thinking hello good morning mm -hmm. so th these things are more I wouldn't call them abstract but someone said there's nothing more practical than a good theory your practice is informed by your thinking so I will try to shape your entrepreneurial thinking about your idea and then we will put that into a more rigorous framework. Partners will come in later on and look at business model and uh, business plan software with you and also help you to put your ideas into a business plan. So into something that other people may look at and assess with regard to their viability for commercialization. So my Tour de force, and it is really a tour de force, um, covers two aspects. So we have twice one hour. One is more on, on general things on commercialization, and then the second part is more on business models and the business plan, because that's more tangible for you. But again, that will become really tangible in the afternoon. So think about this as a reflection piece for you to become sensitized to things that you need to take into account. And please interrupt me anytime you want. This is not a one-way uh, thing, hopefully not. Uh, if you want to have more detail on one thing, please stop me, ask questions. That, that's, that's part of the game. You will actually get the slides. Um, I'm happy to make them available. So you don't have to write everything down. You will, you will be able to get the slides. If you want to and I gave you some, some things to read, Harvard Business Review article, etc. So more applied things to read. Um, but if you want to have more to read, that's the book we normally um, suggest as a, as a kind of primer starting point. Um, Innovation and Entrepreneurship by Bessant and Tid. Innovation and Entrepreneurship. This is the third edition. Every time they seem to have a new thing. Last edition was thicker and had apples on it. I don't know why. No idea um, what the metaphor will be. Am I too quick? Is the English OK? Yeah? yeah? Yes. Good. <coughs> OK, so let's just go into it and then do a little bit on, on commercialization of innovation. Basically, you know what an innovation is. You, you, you have innovations in your mind. It's an adoption of an idea or behavior pertaining to a product, service, device, system, policy, or program. So don't think about your innovation necessarily as a product or service. An idea can be an innovation. A positioning can be an innovation. A policy or a system can be an innovation. It is something new that needs to be adopted into a system. And the system can be commercial or non-commercial. <coughs> so what you want to do is, usually you have a, especially if you are technologically minded, you have an invention in mind. Something that is new, that is possible. Does it make sense in the commercial world? Is there someone who has waited for it? And how does it need to look like in order for the someone who has possibly waited for it to be actually convinced that they should buy it and part with money? So the rationale behind that is the translation of an invention into a real innovation. An innovation is a commercialized uh, invention. And you, you are, so to speak, on this, on this uh, uh, step change between that. So obviously you know it's not about technology. Some of the best and most successful 
commercializations are not technology driven. They are seemingly very simple. Starbucks, Hagedash, McDonald's, Zara, they are all not technology driven innovations and have made entrepreneurs uh, into very, very big businesses. Innovations also don't necessarily have to be groundbreaking and new and earth shattering to the world. They can also be new to an adopting um, uh, organization that does something different with it. Amazon's Kindle wasn't the first um, reader, but they made it into a mass product. Obviously, they are in a different position from you as an individual entrepreneur. But this wasn't a new technology. They just did something with an already existing technology. <coughs> so it's about opening up new markets, opening up new opportunities. Um, these could be established and mature ones. For instance, all of these things that we now take for granted, low-cost airlines, were an innovation that entrepreneurs pushed into the market, into a very established market where no one thought, well, something new could happen, the airline market. So no thrills and low-cost airlines uh, are clearly such an innovation. And think about this, and I was quite happy when I looked through your um, suggestions, think about especially service-related innovations. 80% of our economy is services. So it would be quite normal that, that services have to be important and an important concept in your innovation. And maybe you have a technological innovation, but you sell it because of what service it can do, the service it renders. And therefore, you may think about your invention as technology, but when you talk to the market, when you talk to venture capitalists, when you talk to funding bodies, when you talk to customers, you may talk about something completely different, which is the service that this technology can render. So maybe you have to be schizophrenic. Internally, try to think about how to optimize the technology. But externally, when you talk to others, you're thinking more about, well, what can it do for them? For me as a customer, technology itself is not exciting. Only if the technology can do something for me, then it becomes exciting. If it does something better, more interesting, that's the hook. And that's you have, what you have to convey. And that's the service. And some of these companies did that. <coughs> Services also have advantages. They have lower capital costs. So opportunities for new entrants are easier. They can also be introduced more quickly. They can also be changed more quickly compared to technology-based products. So service innovations are actually quite interesting for, for entrepreneurs. Innovations, especially technology growth in the last, say, 200 years has been well, the driver of what we do. Uh, for thousands and thousands of years, there were innovations, but now we, we see something that is logarithmic uh, beyond any scale. And it will continue like that. So the entrepreneurial sphere is certainly a, a sphere that will not go away. So you're in the right sphere. <coughs> and it's about basically making innovation competitive, so that's the commercialization, in order to then allow for growth and survival of your organization. Your organization hasn't started yet. You as an entrepreneur are just starting, but you have to already think about now, okay, well, what is the future? Ultimately, survival is important. 50% of all new ventures die in the first year. Another 40% die in the second year. That's normal. You have to live with that. Any entrepreneur has to live with that. If you're not prepared to have that mindset, entrepreneurial spheres are very difficult for you. <coughs> with the innovation you change something. You have to change something in the world. If you, if you just do a Me Too, you will not get traction. So you have to think about what is it really that you're changing? And it's never the technology. It's always what the technology does. The app itself doesn't change something. It is what a customer could do with the app. So think about the service that changes things. And you have to be a little bit paranoid to, to survive. Um, you have to always think about, yeah, you may be extinct very quickly. As an entrepreneur, that's a, that's a, a chance that you have. But even Microsoft thinks about not being there in two years. And that drives them. So change is quite, quite normal for innovations. 
innovations make change happen, but other change can then make the innovation itself uh, obsolete as well. <coughs> we are especially interested in this bit, so to speak, an innovation that creates something that is competitive. So that's the commercialization, and that's what we will be talking about, how to get this traction, as I call it. <coughs> no, just, just some things, but you see, new, new things are very important. For instance, in Germany, up to or more than one-third of all economic activities relates to new things. So there's a constant change. Yes, you are in the right sphere. <coughs> when you think about your innovation and your commercialization, it is a strategic process, so it can be planned, it can be managed. That's the good news. So there are things that you can do and need to do. You need to develop the venture, build a business plan, implement things, for instance, by prototyping it, testing it, bringing it to the market, initial beta test, and first customer sales. But you also need to think about, okay, why am I doing it? For whom do I do it? And what do I get out of it? Creating and capturing value. We will talk about that as well. So how do you, for instance, appropriate value that you create. You're doing something new, you're changing things, which is valuable to customers, other businesses or end consumers. And they may be ab able and willing to pay something for it, but how do you make sure that what they pay actually goes to you and is big enough to make the investment work? How do you scale it? How do you grow it? Uh, very difficult for entrepreneurs. The, the, someone said recently, the first sale is always easy. The second sale is difficult. The second customer that you need to get. The first sale is relatively easy. <coughs> Innovation is the starting point. It provides an opportunity. But we need to understand the innovation a little bit better. This opportunity of jumping out of something that we are into something completely new. Innovation doesn't happen. You make it happen. You make the commercialization happen. You're responsible. You're driving it. Everyone else is possibly there and possibly interested in it, but you're driving it, you're in charge. You, you need to frame the situation so that your innovation gets traction. The world hasn't, hasn't waited for your new idea. You must convince the world. You're in the business of telling stories about why your whatever it is, is really worthwhile and is valuable. <coughs> so you need to have vision, passion, Important is plain hard work. Entrepreneurship is not, not something for the faint-hearted. Uh, there's a lot of hard craft about it. It's like any talent. If you're good at something, it's 10% talent and 90% really hard work. Same with your idea. You have to have the right idea, but that's only 10% of it. The rest is writing business cases, doing calculations, going out, talking to customers, getting endorsements, etc etc and what for instance these business plan software that we will show you does to you is to discipline you it tells you have you thought about this have you thought about that have you already done this and some of the things that I do with you is also to discipline you in the sense that it gives you ideas what you should think about <coughs> so skillability is about the new opportunity I think you you can do that but then ways to create and exploit this opportunity, and that's what we are talking about. So innovation is a process which can be organized and managed, and ent entrepreneurship drives that. It's, it's the motivation, the individual behind it, that drives it. And then creating value is the purpose of the whole thing. Creating value for your exchange partner, whoever that may be, to define that is already quite difficult, but then also <laughs> obviously value back um, for you. <coughs> We're obviously in this sphere. You're a startup, a new venture, coming from zero. Um, but obviously entrepreneurship happens uh, in, in many different um, guises. So even in established organization, corporate entrepreneurship is quite, quite important. So you are the individual entrepreneur that exploits a new technology or market op opportunity and tries to make sense of it. But you're not so difficult from, for instance, an IBM that totally redeveloped itself into a services uh, solutions company, um, which was also an entrepreneurial activity, but on a very different level. 
<coughs> some of you do product innovation. And the type of innovation is quite important because it, 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 it frames how you convince your, your um, exchange partners. How do you convince your customers or your grant giving bodies? Traditional one is the product innovation. Changes in the offering. In marketing and management, we never speak normally about an, uh, a product. We speak about an offering, something that we offer, we propose to our exchange partner, be it another organization or an end consumer. So that's a new one, a new design of a car, a hybrid engine. It enhances the product or the features. It does something new with that product. But, and this is quite interesting, you could also think about uh, not the offering itself, but how the offering is created. We help other companies, for instance, to create better offerings. Entrepreneurship with regard to process innovations changes in the way a firm creates and delivers its offering. And this is what especially a lot of B2B entrepreneurship does. It helps other companies to do something better. The process of what they do becomes better. So you, for instance, make their manufacturing methods better. I think some of you is talking about retail labeling and things like that. Obviously that, that retailers are B2B customers and they would use this to make their own process um, of delivery of something more effective and efficient. So it enhances a firm's operational eff effectiveness. Well, <coughs> This usually affects um, sales. This affects costs, and therefore the profit margin. So different drivers. Therefore, you will also have to tell a different story. Again, commercialization is very much about your business plan that tells a story. And a story has to be convincing. By the way, a business plan has two stories, a financial story and a business story. The financial story, the, so the numbers are important but you sell with a business story. That needs to convince. And if you're in the area of process innovation, your business story has to be about that. That's what anyone wants to know before they give you money to develop your innovation, for instance. If it's about an offering innovation, it's how, how does it create sales? <coughs> Services is quite interesting because in services, we have the issue that the offering is about a process and a consumption, uh, so a production at the same time. We, we, we speak of the concept of, of prosumption. That means that production and uh, consumption of, an, of a service fall together. So the production of a hair, haircut happens while I consume it. Someone is doing a haircut to me and I, my hair changes. So the barber producing something together with me as a customer who consumes it immediately. I have a changed um, haircut. Th that means that for services <laughs> these things become a little bit more um, uh, integrated. <coughs> there are also positioning innovation. This is quite interesting and not many entrepreneurs actually use this as a hook for commercialization. This is about changes in the context in which a product or service is introduced rather than changing the product or service or the process itself. You just take something that already exists and put it into a new context. For instance, into a new market. That's fair. That, that's an innovation. It's having the idea that this can be transposed and also create value in a different context where it hasn't been used before. Many good, especially serial entrepreneurs, can sniff out these positioning innovations. Again, it's something that you normally don't think about. We always want to do something new in terms of technology or process or service, something that wasn't there. We find it, oh, an entrepreneur that uses something that exists already and just puts it into a new uh, context, that's not really an entrepreneur. But this is extremely successful. So shift in the target market. Lucozade is a, an example. You know Lucozade, the kind of soft drink? May not be uh, uh, happening in your country. That now is... <coughs> Uh, an entrepreneur has taken that and has said, look, Zaid, I will actually take your product, your offering, kind of soft drink, into a different market, change it slightly, and make it relevant for the fitness market as a medical con uh, convalescence uh, um, offering. Very successful niche product, but very successful. Hagendash has done this, the same, actually, uh, by shifting from 
an original market into a very new market to add um, new things to it. <coughs> then there are, you are not working in this area, but I just wanted to paradigm innovation. So, so change everything that we know. They change the underlying mental model of how the world works. The internet is one of the things. The steam engine changes how things can be done. Shifting, shaping an entire market. Um, Starbucks, low-cost airlines, uh, this Mercedes car, um, drone delivery, these are all things that, that, that are potentially paradigm sh uh, shifts. For instance, drone delivery in the delivery um, uh, and logistics area. Um, usually you're not in that area. This is much more difficult. <coughs> usually you work, th these are called S-curves. So at the beginning, something is not very well performing, but may sell very well because it's new. But then it uh, performs much better over time, but at some point it reaches a kind of limit. It evens out, it is an inflection point where um, the, the offering or the offering class um, comes to the end of its, so to speak, performance increase. <coughs> you want to be somewhere in here. It's much more difficult to improve up here when the offering class is already up here. There's not much um, way to improve. So you want to be here where there's still a lot of improvement. And these are all incremental um, innovations and you, you are very likely working in this incremental innovation. But think about where your offerings um, technology and marketing S-curve is. Is that a new offering class? Can you really expect that there's a lot of performance improvement still there? Or are you already working in an area where it's very difficult to add new value to something? Then the radical information, innovations, they create a new technology S-curve. So something that supersedes the old one. CD super, superseding tapes. Well, after the CD, then streaming, superseding CDs. So th they come all at some point to the end of their S-curve. Innovations that happen here usually are not A, successful, or B, easily fundable. And the VCs that look at what you do make an assessment of where they think you are. If they think you are here, hmm, you have a very difficult story to tell. So, old logistics model, new logistics model, total change, radical innovation, and therefore also a paradigm shift. Uh, not interested. <coughs> so, how, how can you actually compete through an innovation, through a commercialization? You can incrementally or radically change a process, incrementally or radically change an offering, incrementally or radical, radically change the position of something that's already there or have a paradigm shift. Most, most of your stuff, I guess, is here. And most of it is incremental. So that means you also have to uh, tell a business case that adheres to what someone expects about an incremental offering innovation, offering commercialization. Don't claim that you will change the world. You don't. Don't claim that you um, really introduce cost uh, benefits. You, most likely you will not. I think one or two of your projects are actually here. So know in which um, area you are, you are actually <coughs> intending to compete and then tell the appropriate story. Um, I'll come back to that at some point. I think I have it again. Again, i do that later. So, you all have good ideas. But commercialization and success in innovation is not about your good idea. That's, so to speak, a must. It's about understanding the process of managing the commercialization of that nice idea. This can be organized and managed. That's the good news. That's why you are here. That's why business schools also um, are involved, because we are thinking about, well, how is this done? And what, what, what works and what doesn't? 
So it's not about being lucky and being in the right place. That's something that yeah happens or doesn't happen, but you can't you can't manage that. We want to in increase your likelihood to succeed by not depending on luck, by not depending on being in the right place at the right time. So by stacking the odds uh, in your favor. <coughs> so bridging the gap between the idea and the commercial success. And there are some steps that, that you are at the moment going through. Recognizing the opportunity. What is the opportunity actually that relates to your idea? <coughs> there are always lots of opportunities. You will think about your idea at this point as if it can be only used to ex be exploited in one way. Most likely that's not the case. Think about alternatives. Sometimes the best way to commercialize your idea is in a totally different um, area that you haven't thought about. We work a lot with kinetics, which is a, um, really a, a blue ocean <coughs> innovation company, high technology company, spun out of the Ministry of Defense in the UK. And we worked with them on um, a kind of radar system, um, a low frequency wave radar system, it has a relatively um, low capacity. And they were thinking about, okay, radar. Hmm, okay. Radar obviously has, has something to do with air traffic. So th they thought about how to use that in air traffic. But the idea was not very commercializable in that area, or it, it wouldn't have had a lot of um, uh, traction. So we actually looked at different ways of how they could use this idea. And they now apply it in two very, very different arenas. One is um, harbor surveillance, so ports. Ports are relatively small, so you don't need a radar that uh, goes um, uh, uh, long ways. And it's two-dimensional. It's not three-dimensional as, as air traffic. It's two-dimensional, or relatively two-dimensional. So they have now monopolized um, port-based radar systems that look at port traffic so that container ships in the port don't run into each other. Second application that they came up with is, OK, they were in the air traffic area, but that didn't work. But what, airports. What airports traditionally did was, after every fifth takeoff or landing, someone had to basically drive over the um, landing strip to see whether there were any obstacles on the landing strip. It's not very good if you take off or, or, or land and there's a metal piece from the previous plane still lying on the, on the, um, on the airstrip. <coughs> so someone had to physically drive um, these three kilometer long um, airstrips and see is there something actually lying on there. We found out that their radar system is so sensitive that it could actually pick up anything that, that lies on the airstrip. And again, they commercialized that. Now it's basically built into virtually every airport so that no one has to drive up and down anymore. And that was something they'd never thought about initially. The idea wasn't meant for anything like that. So think about what is really the opportunity. It's not the first that comes to mind. Potentially there, there are other things. <coughs> Search and scan the environment. Do market research and competitor analysis. It's not just you. There are so many others around. If you, if you go to a venture capitalist, if you build a business plan and you don't know who your competitors are, potential competitors, you disqualify yourself immediately. So understand what the competitive situation is. <coughs> be, be clear what drives the need for your innovation. What drives the opportunity? Is it, for instance, changing customer needs? Oh, there are quite, quite a lot of competitors, but they do something for a customer need that has moved on. And we are now going in with a new idea that addresses this new customer need. Or is it a new technological opportunity? Everything else that is out there does certain things, but not as good as this new idea. Again, you, you can't be good on all of these things. It, it's not necessary that <coughs> your um, opportunity has to be driven by all of these things, but you have to be clear in pinpointing what you're doing where the opportunity stems from. <coughs> the second thing is have a clear plan of how do you need, what kind of resources do you need in order to get 
to a commercialization after the idea and how do you get this resource? Innovation consumes resources. It's an investment. Investments have a nasty habit. They have a hockey stick curve um, characteristic. Hockey stick curve goes down and then up. So first of all, cumulative and negative investments. You pour money into something and you don't get any, anything out of it. And only over time, hopefully, you will get some um, sales and, and also increase it. So <laughs> therefore, it's risky. <coughs> and you have only limited time, money, and knowledge. You have to acknowledge what you have in terms of resources and what you need in order to commercialize. There's a gap analysis that you have to do. <coughs> and you have resource requirements and unfortunately also uncertain outcomes. So how do you want to mobilize resources and skills? We will come back when we look at the business plan. That's also very important. Your idea doesn't commercialize itself. It needs to be commercialized. So what kind of investment resources do you need and where you do, do you get them from? <coughs> we will talk about how to use networks, others, to do that later and how to also get money from um, other sources. Then you develop the venture. So once you have the resources, you need to implement things, you do more research and development, you do market studies, competitors, analysis, and prototyping. So now you get evidence. Does it work? Under what circumstances does it work? Do customers like it? Why do they like it? How many of them do they like it? You test it, you improve, you understand the innovation and whether and under what conditions it will work. So that's a fine-tuning process. What you think at the moment your innovation is, is most likely not what will come out in the end. And you have to be cognizant of that, that there is a development. Like with Kinetics Radar, <laughs> that was a four-year process until they really made money out of something in an area where they didn't even believe at the beginning they would be playing. <coughs> Develop a business plan, and we will talk about that uh, today, launch, launch into the market and then manage the implementation in the market. In the mar launch in the market is easy. Again, first customer is also easy. How do you get the second customer? How do you get customer loyalty so that they come back? How do you scale it? All of these things you have to think about now. That's, that's unfortunately um, very problematical, but you have to think that. <coughs> Creating value. Capturing the value from the animation. Where is the income coming from? How do you basically recover your investments? How much time does it take to recover the investment? Many companies will at some point work, but they die before they actually get to the point where they work. They've burned all the resources too early. If it needs three years to amortize, but you only have capital for two years, you have a one-year gap in your thinking and you will die before you become successful. Mm, not good. And unfortunately, you even now have to think about this. Exit. <coughs> Venture capitalists, if they give you money, have their own exit strategy in, in mind. They think in five years, four to six year time frames. You have to accept that these are the time frames. So you may actually already think, even before your company really exists, how, if it actually gets off the ground, if it becomes successful, how you disinvest from it. What a good disinvestment strategy is. Because what you do now has to be aligned with that disinvestment strategy. If I want to IPO, so if, you are, if I want to go public with it, <coughs> initial public offering, I will build the commercialization very differently from I actually want to at some point sell it to a big competitor. For an IPO I must optimize profitability. For sales to a competitor profitability may not be that important but scale may be important. Sales, sales volume. So very different ways of building a business 
which, so to speak, is thought through from the end, how you want to exit, what the good exit strategy is. <coughs> so, a kind of um, process. As with all good processes, they are normally not stepwise, but <laughs> iterative and, and go back. Um, but um, especially here in developing the business plan, <coughs> if you don't know how you make the money, you will not succeed, neither if, if you finance it yourself or if you need to get finance from others. So if you have a business plan without a um, profit formula, um, that won't work. So you have to understand why you think you're making money. How can a, the company create value for itself while providing value to the customer? Well, first of all, you must know who is the customer. That's not necessarily obvious. You're coming up with a new chicken um, salsa. Who's the customer? Is it a segment of end consumers? Is it retailers? Is it wholesalers? So are you in a B2B or in a B2C environment? To whom do you market? To whom do you actually um, tell the story of why your offering is so good? <coughs> but then, once you know who the customer is, well, what is the rationale why the customer should be interested in your offering? So what's the value that they get? And how do you get something back? So what's the value that you get, that you capture? So the capturing of the value. That means, first of all, you have to have a revenue model. Customer definition, how many customers are there, what your penetration is likely to be, never overestimate. Oh, within five years we will gain 50% of our target segments. Never happening. <coughs> you have to work with very small numbers, half a percent in two or three years. So you have to have a penetration plan, and on that you build your um, uh, sales uh, model. <coughs> but sales are only one thing. You also need to understand your cost, because, well, they actually make up your, they affect your profit margin. So variable cost, fixed costs, economies of scale. Is it likely that if you sell more, your costs go down, or will they always stay the same? Service companies have a nasty habit of not having good economies of scale. Product-based companies have a good habit of having economies of scale. Um, so again, depending on what you are, you may be able to exploit this or not. <coughs> and out of that, you can build a margin model. Margin is your profitability. So are you having a low margin, large volume model, which is usually a market penetration model? I want to get lots of sales, therefore I decrease my price and get loss of sales, but also my margin goes down. Or do I have a high margin and low volume? Oh, I only sell to the ones that really want to pay a lot of premium for my offering. That means, yeah, I will not sell to many, but to the ones that I sell, I sell at a very big margin. <coughs> Both work really, really well, but you need to know what you want to do. This is a kind of elite price premium strategy. So your channel decisions, for instance, which retailer you use, will be different from a kind of discounting decision. Obviously, if you have good economies of scale in your cost model, a large volume may be interesting because you get the costs down. <coughs> if you're a service and you don't have economies of scale, you may actually go for a high margin, low volume model. Again, Lisa, yep, uh, was, was there a question or? No, just a sneeze. <coughs> the fourth thing is what we call resource velocity. So I guess these things you have heard and the business plan software will actually ask you about these things. You have to have that. And anyone who wants to invest in your company will actually ask, okay, where are these things? Do you, do you actually um, know all these things. Reloss velocity, speed at which resources flow through um, inventory turnover revenue cycles. That has also something to do with cash flow. Or are you running out of money before the good times start? Before you're making really a sustainable profit? 
are you burning your capital before before you actually make positive um, revenues. And again, most companies have a problem with that. The dot-com um, bubble <coughs> was all about that. Many of these um, business models were really good, but they needed too much initial investment, especially marketing spend, which they burned so quickly that they didn't get to the sustainable phase before they run out of their capital. And capital is your scarce resource. So therefore also time is your scarce resource. <coughs> um, in a business plan, you normally want to convince others, not necessarily at the moment customers, but others to give you some resources, usually a venture capitalist or others. So it translates abstract and ambiguous goals that you have in your mind into operational needs and clear stories has risk opportunity um, assessments which are made explicit. Competition, market, consumer structures are all made explicit. <coughs> so it's actually a systematization, a business plan of, of your thinking. And therefore it's a framework that disciplines you. It's about communicating your business idea externally, for instance to funding bodies, but also internally it, it sh forces you to get your idea into a precise structure. Because you have good ideas, but commercially they're not precise yet. And that's what you have to develop. <coughs> what are problems with the business plans? So this is again sensitizing you to what will go wrong. Too much emphasis on technology or on the newness of something that you have invented. No one cares about that. It's what it does that people care about it. Does what it does make sense? Is that helping some people? Having an easier life, making more money, whatever. <coughs> Lack of a sales plan. How do you want to sell? Through which channels? Detailed marketing strategy. We come back to that. Competitor analysis. 75% of all business plans um, fail because of an insufficient competitor analysis. And 90% have insufficient financial forecasting and sensitivity analysis. So that's financial forecasting like the velocity analysis, like the cost model, like the revenue model. And it has no sensitivity analysis, which is, well, well what happens if I change my assumptions by 10%? Does everything break down? Do I become unprofitable? Or is it still valid as a, as a business plan? If you, if you normally do not fulfill uh, a 10% sensitivity analysis, no one uh, will take the risk. Your business plan has to be relatively robust and resilient against shocks. So sensitivity analysis are always uh, in there. <coughs> Where do you get the funds from? Well, you can sell fund, but usually th these are not angles, these are angels. <laughs> um, Business angels, venture capitalists, but also banks sometimes can, can help you with this. But they will all want to have a business plan. So you have to develop a business plan in order to acquire resources. Um, this is small amounts. It goes much, much bigger if you go into this direction. This is more risky than this. However, these guys <laughs> want to have usually someone who has a track record. Um, in whom they invest. So if you don't have a track record, you may not um, necessarily uh, get many venture capitalists interested in you. But business angels are more likely. <coughs> business incubators, clusters are an alternative. Incubators actually are very good for guys like you. So they provide a small amount of financial resources, but also mentoring and coaching and networking. They take a little bit of equity, but they put you into an environment where risk is taken out of your um, business. And certain resources like, um, like management resources, management knowledge, IP knowledge can be generated through incubators. Not going into that or any of these. So. 
And then you have to think about the exit and the harvesting strategy. 40% of all businesses fail, 60% fail within the first two years. So think about how you deal with that. Failure is not, not just an option, failure is likely. But will it destroy you and your family if, if, if this business fail? That then you should go in, shouldn't go in. How do you mitigate against this very likely um, issue? Usually these failures are because of poor financial control, for instance, burning capital too quickly. Very often lack of managerial ab ability and experience. So yeah, you're on top of the technology, you're on top of the core offering, but you're not on top of the commercialization. No strategy for transition, growth, especially growth, and especially exit. Leaving that to, oh, will happen organically. No, it doesn't, it is pre-planned. Small number of customers that yeah, <coughs> you have acquired and it works well, but then you can't scale and grow. And at some point these customers will go away and then you slowly die. So you never got to get off the ground, but you also um, die slowly. Not a good way to be. <coughs> um, the one that succeed, well, Acquisition or merger with other companies is always quite, quite a good um, option. And think, as I said, about this now. It's a good exit strategy. <coughs> Sale of the business to another company, or private equity company, or an IPO. Again, depending on what you think you want to do with this uh, venture in the end, you will now start to build the venture differently. <coughs> so, building the case and assessing the case involves the business plan and in the second part later on we will talk about th this business plan in, in a little bit more detail. I showed you the four elements of the, that are relevant um, of the business plan. But the business plan is not everything. I also show you other things that especially venture capitalists look at. But there is what we call a kind of ceremonial role of the business plan. If you're an entrepreneur you have to have your business plan in your back pocket. And it has to be very good and very well developed. But it will also develop over time, all the time. So you don't write one business plan, you constantly revisit your business plan and go back to the business plan and make it better. <coughs> However, I also want to think about something here, which is actually not really in this, in this phase model. Something between resources and then harvesting which is, if you have the resources, that to make the offering happening, to really create something that is tangible, that can be actually sold. So as a, in, in technology, that would be um, um, beta models and, and, and testing and things. <coughs> there is a kind of way of project management that you need to introduce here, kind of stage gate model, as we call it. So, you need to constantly think about, should I go, should I continue? Should I go to the next development phase? Okay, I built a prototype. Should I now go to the next thing and build the real thing as a mock-up? Okay, I built the mock-up. Should I now go and test it as a real application with a customer? Okay, should I now go and launch it, not just with this customer, but into the general market? So these are stages. And at each end of the stage, you have a kind of gate. And you decide whether you want to th walk through the gate or whether the gate should stay shut and you should dis disinvest and disengage from this. <coughs> know up front what in the development phase you want to find. So with the prototyping. If the prototyping shows this, I go further. If it doesn't show this, I will disinvest. You have to have so to speak, KPIs, key performance indicators for each stage agreed before the actual stage in order to know whether you're successful in that stage. So this is the kind of fine balance between costs of continuing the, pro uh, the project, <coughs> which nevertheless may not succeed. There's a danger of closing down too soon. We call these false negatives. So sometimes something doesn't seem to work but that's only temporary, you could um, rectify it. But 
I want to encourage you to, through this process, have a kind of stage in mind where you say, here I want, I want to see these deliverables. If my prototyping doesn't provide these deliverables, I will disengage. If my beta testing doesn't provide these deliverables, I will disengage, etc., etc. Be very clear about this, otherwise you run with, with a dead idea for too long. That's not good for anyone. <coughs> so a structured and staged um, process with decision criteria or gates. This also reduces your uncertainty. It makes you feel better, by the way, which is also important. You have to, entrepreneurship is, is uh, not easy and uh, rather uh, demanding, so you also have to think about your own psyche. <coughs> so that's, that's quite, quite important. Um, do I really want to go through this at the moment? No. Um, maybe just this. One of the issues that many of the business plans, as we have seen before, fall short of success is they do not have a good understanding of markets. The marketing plan is basically rubbish or not existent. So, <coughs> define your target market. To whom do you want to sell and why? And why should they buy from you? And who are they? And how many are there? And how many will actually adopt your, um, adopt your um, offering? How quickly will you penetrate this market? Who are the competitors in this market? All of this has to go in here. <coughs> and then you can think about product price, promotion and place, or any other marketing activity. So what's your offering and what does it do? And why is it better than others? At what kind of price point do you want to um, introduce it? And how do you control that the price will actually be, be paid? What kind of communication will you have? And what is your distribution channel? Do you go from door to door yourself? Do you use a retailer? Do you have an e-only channel? <coughs> but then if you're a service, you have another three elements that you need to think about. Services are usually delivered through people, even if they are processes. So sometimes this, this uh, is um, um, part of this. But very often we have people involved. Um, there are always people involved if they are customer involved. They are people. And a service, production and consumption fall together. So we also have to make sure that, that they know what they are actually doing with our service and that they get the most value out of our service. So how do we, how do we incorporate the human actor? How do we educate, for instance, our customer? <coughs> the physical environment of a service in which the service is delivered, the components that make up this physical environment are sometimes as important as the service itself. How do you assess a barber? if you don't know the barber. It's a service. You, you cannot test drive, so to speak, a service. You can test drive a car, but you cannot test drive a service. So how do you assess whether I think this is a good barber or a bad barber if I, if I don't have any experiences? I look at the physical environment. Is it clean? Does it have a kind of chic environment? So here the physical environment is an indicator of, of the quality of the service. So that's quite, quite important to build into your marketing plan as well. And the process is the flow of activities that needs to be uh, thought of. <coughs> Therefore, you need to manage the service quality. In a service business plan, I would want to see how you make sure that your service has a good quality. With a product, it's a manufacturing or production issue to make sure that the quality of the offering is good. With the service, it's much more difficult, and therefore it needs to be controlled and managed much better. <coughs> For instance, there must be aspects that create reliability. So this is from, from research. Um, how do we provide a service that is reliable? Ability to perform a promised service dependable and accurately, over and over and over again. Responsiveness, willingness to interact and help customers, assurance, employees' knowledge and courtesy with their ability to inspire trust, empathy, so interacting um, with, with the customer and putting themselves 
um, putting yourselves into the customer's trip. This service quality and the managing of these uh, characteristics helps to achieve customer satisfaction and in the end customer loyalty. Again, that's much more difficult for a service offering than a um, product offering and you need to have that in there. Okay, and the tangibles, so the physical environments, is that um, appropriate and how do I ensure that this is kept appropriate? Not going through that, but you can have a look at that at some point. <coughs> um, I think I'd go through that anyway later on, so I don't need to. That's, that's nice. If your service, this is self-explanatory, you, you can read about that um, later. So before we break, I just wanted to quickly um, do this. Because one of the aspects that we spoke about before was getting resources. You don't have all resources that you need. Accept that. To make your venture successful, you need resources from the outside. Usually you don't have the money. Usually you don't have the management knowledge. Usually you don't have legal knowledge, etc., etc., etc. So where do you get it from? Where do you get, for instance, knowledge about customers from? You have to mobilize others very often in order to get these crucial resources. And that's good. <coughs> no one can have all the resources themselves. But knowing what resources you need, and then in the second step, knowing where to get the resources is part of your business plan. It's essential. Innovation is about combining resources, of which some are controlled by you, the idea, some are not controlled by you. Therefore, mobilize the resources from outside of the firm. So that means you have to interact with the outside. That is complex. And it is really like that. It is a complex mess, and you have to manage that. You can, for instance, pool complementary resources, knowledge, skills, technology, assets. You can do that by sharing certain creativity or experimentation. In these clusters, for instance in incubators, there are only entrepreneurs in the incubators. So you can share things. They are in the same situation as you are, maybe in a totally different industry, but they face the same issues. And they have also mobilization needs. So you can together mobilize, for instance, IP lawyers. They will also have an IP issue, as you may have. <coughs> share the risks. So therefore, networking, this is not your uh, uh, Facebook uh, activity, networking is the strategic interaction with other resource um, providers, the negotiations with them, the knowledge exchange with them, that's networking, is an important process that you have to be aware of. So to some extent that means a gap analysis. What are the resources that you need? At what phase in your commercialization process? What are the resources that you have? Gap analysis, and out of that comes a plan of how do I mobilize the resources that I clearly do not have? <coughs> and that's not bad. That has to be in a business plan. Don't think that if a business plan says we don't have certain resources, the business plan is not good. No, it's good because it says that, and it's aware of what is needed. Bah, we don't want that. Do um, you know this? No, you don't know this. You may know this. This is around the corner. Silicon Roundabout, Shoreditch. Huge cluster where entrepreneurs, high-tech and creative industry entrepreneurs just huddle together. And proximity, physical proximity, is a success factor for entrepreneurs. To be together with other entrepreneurs seems to be making the whole thing less risky, seems to make the networking more easily achievable, seems to make resource acquisition um, easier. <coughs> Clusters or incubators are basically entrepreneurs huddling together. Incubators is an organization that offers office space funding, basic services um, to startups in return for certain equity stakes. But entrepreneurs need more than just location or, or this infrastructure. Um, they also want to have um, access to um, other 
uh, resources. And therefore, networked incubators are actually a very good um, uh, way to get this. So network incubators um, basically are about the scale and scope of last ex uh, established corporations because they bring together a lot of small entrepreneurs and so to speak together they are they're becoming large. Largeness is good because sharing risk. Largeness is good because you don't have to do everything yourself. You can specialize and then mobilize the specialization of others. <coughs> these and uh, these um, entities, so incubators, they're basically a big house where they're all little offices of um, entrepreneurs. Um, they take a small equity stake, um, but they, they really work very well. So they're also, sometimes they're called accelerators or they have different names, but they're virtually all the same thing, sometimes for different stages of the, um, I don't know. <coughs> they also give you um, certain access to other outside actors that you would otherwise don't have access to. Special business angels. IP lawyers, etc., etc. What an incubator offers is especially these things coaching, funding, information technology, public relations, recruiting, legal aspects, and accounting help. So, some, some very basic things, but some things that you don't want to be bothered with as an entrepreneur. You want to get traction with your idea. And things like thinking about how do I set up my accounting for my new company, oh, that's, that's really dreadful. That, that distracts you. But there are people who can help you with this. Okay, they do it for an equity stake, but so be it. <coughs> so the um, network incubators have quite a lot of um, uh, advantages. And these are some of the regional clusters. I'm not going through, through them. Okay, so that was a, the first two to force. Uh, it will become a little bit structured when we uh, more structured when we look about um, what a business model and a business plan really is about. Um, but that was, so to speak, the first the first bit through um, a long course uh, in in an hour. And I think now we are in need of some coffee, I guess. Any questions? <coughs>